Good afternoon. My name is Sandy McDonald and I'm the director of the Office of Economic and Small Business Development. I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. This is what we love to do. And they're like, what is he talking about? We love to share information to assure small businesses opportunity to participate in county procurement. And today the focus is going to be on the federal program, 49 CFR. Part 2623, this is dealing with DBE and ACDBE. We're gonna walk you through how to complete the certification application for our federal program. I just wanna make sure that you recognize that the county is committed to informing businesses, to hopefully encouraging businesses to get certified for the local as well as the federal program. And then after getting certified, working with the businesses to assure that they have what they need and they understand how to navigate the process to competitively compete for the county as well as the federal contracts that are made available. So again, beyond this certification technical assistance training, we do not want you to lose contact with our office. We want you to stay in touch, get certified, get engaged, compete in the process, and become one of those additional proud businesses that we have here in Broward County. So thank you. And I'm now gonna turn it over, I believe, to Ms. Roberts. She's a supervisor for our small business specialist section, working with our small businesses and primarily focusing on the devil in the details of certification. Take it over, Cheryl. Thank you, Sandy. And welcome to all who are attending. <clears throat> Um, I was attempting to turn on my video, but I don't think it's working. <clears throat> so anyway, move forward. That's my face. Oh, okay. I got it. Yep. There you go. Hello <laughs> again. Good afternoon. And thank you for attending this, uh, this workshop. Um, you can move forward, Pam. So for the DBE and the ACDBE program, the firm must be 51% owned, managed, and controlled by a socially and economically disadvantaged individual. Your personal net worth must not exceed 1.32 million. You do not have to count the value of your home in the asset section, nor the value of the, um, the mortgage in the liability section of your primary residence. If you have other properties, you do have to account for those. Right now, the DBE gross receipts um, must not exceed 26.29 million for the DBE and 56.42 million for the ACDBE. The business must be an independent business. Um, for the DBE, um, the DBE is actually a federal program. And for the state of Florida, it's run through the Florida Department of Transportation. For um, firms that are interested in the DBE certification, our office handles applications for Broward located firms only. If you're located outside of Broward County, there are several UCPs um, agencies that do applications for um, other firms that are located in other areas. And you can check their website to find out the one closest to you. The owners must be US citizens or permanent residents who belong to one or more of the following ethnic, um, what they've decided are the ethnic backgrounds, um, African-American, Hispanic, subcontinent Asian, Asian Pacific, Native American, and also women-owned businesses. Next slide. You can move on, Pam. So the um, the federal program has um, overall goals to, um, based on um, several calculations, but for, for, and we do triannual. So for 2020 and uh, through 2022, 
the goal on um, federal projects is 13.29%. And for the that for FTA is Transit, Federal Transit Authority, and FAA is Federal Aviation Authority. And for 20 through 2020 through 2022, for FAA, the goal is 17.19. Um, for the for the program, the um, unlike the local program, which most of the projects are funded with Broward County funds, the DBE applies to those projects that are federally funded. So that's why you'll see transportation and aviation mentioned often. You can move forward, Pam. DBEs can have an average annual gross receipts up to twenty six point twenty nine million over the preceding three fiscal years. Um, the, the FTA has just announced um, about a month ago that we can now average over five years if a firm finds itself close to that, to that, um, that, went, that ceiling. Um, so we, we um, will average, if it looks like you're close or you're about to go over the 26.29 million, which um, you know, uh, construction firms sometimes do, then we're able to look at five years of tax returns as opposed to three years. For the ACDBE, they can have an average gross receipts up to 56.42 million. Um, and the slide says three fiscal years, and we can actually go up to five years if the firm finds itself close to that ceiling. Certified companies throughout the state of Florida and outside of Florida can participate in Broward County federally funded contracts. If you're um, certified outside the state of Florida and you wanna become certified within Florida, you can submit an application to any of the UCP um, locations, agencies that do um, applications for the Florida Department of Transportation. What you want to do is submit your, um, your original application that was submitted to your home state. You need the tax returns, both personal and uh, the business. You need the financial statement and you need the most recent letter from your um, home state saying that you're certified in good standing with that state. Once that happens, you will become certified in Florida and able to participate on any of the uh, Florida federally funded projects. Next slide. Next slide. So um, the, the, the most, I don't wanna say difficult, but this, the, the DBE application does require a lot of documentation, much more documentation than the local program um, requires. For the DBE certification, uh, we've included in this slide in this slide our internal supporting documents checklist. This is the documents that I'm looking for when I'm reviewing a DBE application. All of these documents, and this is a two pager, all of these documents must be present in the application for it to be considered complete. If the application is not complete, we will send it back. Um, for, for our local program, we'll, we'll, um, you know, we'll hold it and, and request documents. But for the DBE, we're in a time constraint. So if the application is not complete, we will forward it back to you and let you know what was missing. So um, I'm going to kind of go through the supporting documents checklist because this is the most, um, I, I think, the most confusing for a lot of applicants um, in terms of what they need to submit. So for the first one, of course, you need to submit a resume and I'm gonna skip through some of the ones that are, that are um, obvious. <clears throat> um, the, the personal financial statement for all owners, this is for all owners that are claiming disadvantaged status. So this, if, if there's two owners and one is 51%, we only need the 51% owner's financial statement. And that's a document that's included with the application. Um, Tax returns, again, this is pretty obvious. We need the personal tax returns and we need the firm's tax returns. And the tax returns, please send the entire return, including all schedules. Documented proof of contributions used to acquire ownership. 
Now this is this is one that must be included. But if you if you started your company, say you started your company in 1999, and you don't have the the um, the statement where you submitted. I mean, where you opened your checking account. Say you started your business by opening a checking account in the business's name, and you don't still have that statement. You can write us a, a little statement on your letterhead saying, you know, my business is 20 years old and I no longer have this document. That's acceptable for as a replacement for this, um, this particular one. Um, your firm signed loan agreements, security agreements and bonding forms. You do need to submit copies of these items. If you do not have them, don't simply say not applicable. You need to provide, again, a statement saying that my firm, ABC Construction, has no loan agreement, security agreements, nor do we have bonding. Um, so that, that would be a statement, and you would put that in the, um, in the order. Oh, that's the other thing. This, this checklist is the order of um, the items that you should submit to us, and it makes it easier and faster for us to, um, to review your application. Descriptions of all real estate, including office and storage space, owned and or leased by your firm. Um, if you're a home-based business, that's fine. Again, you don't have to submit to us the deed to your house. You can just, uh, in that state, that same statement, you can say, my, my home is my office, and I have, you know, I have a separate room for my office inside my primary residence, and that suffices. List of equipment or signed lease agreements on those equipment. If you have vehicles that you lease for your business, you want to supply those. You want to list the vehicles that you use and the lease agreements. Again, if you don't have them you, in that statement, you say, I don't have list of, uh, I mean, I don't have vehicles. Or I don't have equipment. Um, on that statement, what you can do is on just one page, you can say like with number five, if you could point to that, um, Pam. Number five, where it says documented proof of contributions used to acquire ownership. You want to just say, I know I don't have, you know, number five, I don't have this because I started the business 20 years ago. And then the next one, if you don't have loan agreements, you put number six, I don't have loan agreements, and so forth and so on. Okay. Um, List of construction equipment. You could say number nine, my firm is not a construction firm and therefore I have no construction equipment. That suffices for that. So the point of this checklist is just to let you know that even if these documents don't apply to your firm, you still need to reference them. You need to let us know that that doesn't apply to your firm. Some of these documents are not, um, what's, what's the word? I. I want to use they you 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 must have them and if you don't have them you need to go get them one of those documents is the bank authorization and signatory cards now some banks um you know when you open your bank account they don't give you a copy of the signatory card you know you sign the card to, to say that you know i'm the person that can sign checks on this account um, a lot of banks don't let you walk away with that once you have opened the account you can go to your bank and ask and request a copy of it. And most banks will give you a copy of it. But there are a few banks that don't want to do that. Um, those particular banks will offer you a letter that says uh, ABC Construction has a checking and savings account at this bank and, and John Doe is the signatory on this account. That suffices for that, but you can't say that you don't have that. We, ha we act actually need that document. The other document we need is year and balance sheets. That's number 11. Year and balance sheets for um, um, firms that are S corps or C corps. Usually in the uh, tax return, there's a schedule L, which is the balance sheet. If the Schedule L is included in the tax returns, then that suffice for number 11. But if it's not, then you need to create balance sheets for the last three years of your business operations. Next slide. Okay, trust agreements held by owner claiming disadvantaged status. If you have a trust agreement um, that's for your, for your kids, so the 
you know, your, your personal finances are um, in a trust for your kids. We don't need to see that. We need to see what is re um, relevant to your firm. So if your firm is, if it has any stocks in trust that, you know, you're leaving to your kids if in, in the unfortunate incident of your passing, then we would need to see that. Um, but if you have trust agreements that are just personal um, financial, we don't, we don't, we don't necessarily need that unless it applies to the business. Proof of citizenship or legal permanent resident status. We do need that. We accept the uh, uh, birth certificates. We accept passports and of course the, res the permanent resident card. Voter registration card, that's not necessary. Um, you can um, highlight number 18 for me, Pam. on the checklist. Yeah, the voter registration card number 18. If you've included the, um, the um, birth certificate or passport, you do not need the voter registration card. We're just, we're, these are some documents that we use to prove citizenship. Um, if you're a partnership or joint venture, you want to include the uh, partnership agreement or joint venture agreement. Um, this section where it required documents for corporation or LLC. If you're a corporation, we need the articles of incorporation, stock certificates if you're more than um, one owner. We need stock certificates, shareholders agreements, and minutes. Um, you can Google these documents and, and um, you will find templates for these documents if you don't already have them. Um, bylaws and agreements, of course. And then that last one, number seven, is for LLCs. We need the official certificate of formation and operating agreement for LLCs and any amendments, of course. If you're not a trucking company or a commodity supplier, these next two sections you can you can ignore. They don't apply to you, and we don't need any any statement from you saying that you know not applicable or whatever. Um, you just you can ignore those two sections. But if you are a commodity supplier, um, you want to provide proof of warehouse um, ownership or rental the list of product lines that you intend to sell during, you know, during projects that are federally funded and list of distribution equipment owned and or lease. Okay, next slide. All right, now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the application. You can forward it, Pam. So on this, on the, this is the first page of the application. <clears throat> the contact person and title, I suggest that, that the owner, uh, that you use the owner's name and title in this section. Um, sometimes people who have, you know, uh, a pretty decent staff will have their um, office administrator or whatever fill out their applications for their, for certifications. And they'll put you know, the office administrator as the contact person. I suggest that you put the owner as the contact person here. If you would like some other person to be the contact person on any um, project related uh, communications, then you can just let us know and we'll make that available in your um, listing in the directory. Um, the rest of that is pretty self-explanatory. You wanna put your name, address, email, um, and website if you have one. Prior or other certifications, this is for the interstate certifications. If you were certified in another state, you want to fill out this section here, letting us know who, uh, where your home state is. Section two, general information. In this section, you really want to provide us with detail of the activities that your firm um, provides. The um, Part two, well, number two on this list is for you to list um, your applicable NAICS codes. But when I'm reviewing an application, I will look at the description of your business services and make sure that you've included all the NAICS codes that are available to you. Um, because some people don't, you know, uh, um, searching NAICS codes can be a little bit complicated or you might miss something. And um, staff here have been doing this for a long time. So we recognize um, the NAICS codes that would apply to the services that you describe in part one. 
So make sure you're pretty explicit and detailed about the services that you provide. Um, where it says uh, number five, well, the firm was established on, and you can give us the date that you opened it or you registered with the state of Florida, um, the Division of Corporations. That's the date the firm started. You may not have started actively participating in the firm until maybe two years later, but you opened the firm in 2019. That's the date that we need to see when you open the firm. And method of acquisition, for most people, it would be starting a new business, even if that business is 30 years old. When it first started, it was a new business. So you want to you want to check starting a new business. But if it was um, formed any other um, method, then you want to check the appropriate box. And if it's other, you know, check other and explain how you acquired the business. Next slide. Okay, your federal tax ID, very important. Do not put your social security number here. For some um, um, sole proprietors, they will, you know, because they haven't created a uh, structure uh, like an LLC or an S corp or a C corp, they're just a, you know, a one person um, um, organization. Please do, even if you're, you are that structure, you're a sole proprietor, please do get a federal tax ID number. Um, you don't want to have your social security number, you know, within your file. So uh, create a tax ID number is very easy. One of the few things that the IRS does that's, that's pretty quick. Uh, you fill out the form and within 24 hours, you'll get a tax ID number type of legal business structure. Here's where you want to tell us how your firm is structured. Number of full-time employees, please include yourself in that number. So if it's just you, you would put one here. Um, if you have part-time or seasonal employees, you want to include them. The firm's, the number nine, the firm's gross receipts, make sure that you this section that what you fill out here matches the tax returns that you're submitting to us. So if you made, you know, 516,700, you don't want to just say 515,000 rounding it up. You want to give us the exact number and that that number matches the tax returns that you submit. This next little section says gross receipts of affiliate firms, any firm that you have ownership in more than 5% ownership in needs to be um, accounted for. So we would need tax returns for that firm as well. Even if you're a 50% owner of that firm, we still need the tax returns for that firm. Relationships and, and dealings with other businesses. Here's where you're gonna tell us um, if you're like sharing office space or um, you know someone's allowing you to store equipment in their yard um, that sort of thing. You want to check yes here and then explain what that relationship is. And you have plenty of space here to, to you know, tell us what that relationship is. Has any other firm had an ownership interest in your firm or at in, presently or at any time in the past? You want to answer that. And then number three, you want to follow that up with um, answers to these questions. Make sure you check all the boxes. Go to the next slide. This is the um, page for the majority owner. If there's one person who's 51% owner or more, that person fills out this page. Um, what we want to know is name, title, and this is where you put your home phone number, not the business phone number, and your home address. Number of years as owner. Percentage owned, make sure you fill all that out. Class of stock owned, date acquired, you know, the rest of that. Um, section B, familial relationships. Um, we see a lot of husband wife firms. So on this page, you would, you know, you would list that relationship or maybe it's a mother son. I've had a couple of mother son businesses. You wanna list that relationship. Um, also, if that person is a is part owner of your firm, do they have management or super supervisory function for any other business? So is that person employed elsewhere? 
If so, we need to know the name of that business and their title. Um, the rest of this is pretty self-explanatory. It really is about um, your relationships with other firms, if there is any. If there's not, you check no and you keep going. Go to the next slide, Pam. This is for the, um, the owner that has less than 51% ownership. Uh, remember when I talked about the financial statement and, and we're only looking for a financial statement for the 51% or more owner of the firm, we still need to know about the minority owner, the person who has less than 51%. So you do want to fill this section out and answer these questions. Next slide. Um, oh, go back one slide. I'm sorry, I missed something. This, this um, if you're 100% owner and you filled out the, the previous page, you don't need to fill out uh, that top section. Pam, could you highlight the section A for the next page? I'm sorry, the next page, the, yeah, owner information. This is the, um, the person who has less than 51%, if that person doesn't exist, say you own the company 100%, you don't need to fill out this top um, um, section, but look at the questions below. You do need to answer those questions. If you have um, or have a relationship with another firm, if you don't, then you can leave this blank. Okay, go, go for uh, forward, Pam. All right, this section lists the, the board, of director, board of directors or the owners, the, the uh, managing members uh, or officers of the company. If you're an LLC, the number two, where it says board of directors, you can leave that blank. But um, number one, you do need to list who the officers of the company are. So that would be you as the president and um, whoever else you have um, as an owner not necessarily employee, but as an owner. You want to fill that section out. You want to answer the questions here. And um, I want to stress in this section, section B, Pam, if you could sort of highlight section B, duties. Someone's saying they can't see the form. Uh, duties of owners, officers, directors, managers, and key personnel. You want to make sure you list at least the 51% owner and the most important um, less uh, minority owner. And we need to know what these people are responsible for. So um, always, frequently, seldom, and never are the choices here. Go forward, Pam. Again, these are um, these are some extra space for, you know, say you have a vice president and a field supervisor or, um, you know, a chief financial officer or, or office manager, and, and that's a key employee, you want to list them here and tell us what their functions are. Again, you want to answer the questions there, and the, the next section down with the lines are uh, where you list your equipment. move forward. If you have storage space, of course, you want to list it here. If you use an outside payroll um, management firm, you want to list that. Your financial banking information, those are the banks that the business does banking with, not your personal um, bank account, but your business bank account. And uh, section F is important. You want to list the sources of of um, income, be it loans from even from family members, you want to list list that here, and let us know um, how you're paying it back. So if you if you fill out this section here, then I would expect to see as a supporting document the loan agreement that corresponds with what you fill out here. On G, where it says list contributions or transfers of assets, um, sometimes say you want to loan, you want to take your personal, you know, maybe you have 10 grand and you want to invest that in your business. So you're going to loan it to your firm out of your personal um, savings or checking or whatever. 
you want to list that here because what you're doing is you're loaning your firm um, or, or my, not investment that you don't expect to get back, but you're loaning your firm money that you expect payment back. Um, if you have any questions about that, I know that's a little complicated. Certainly give, give us a call in this office. Uh, current licenses. You, if you're a construction firm, then list the licenses that you have here. If you're a professional, a licensed professional, say an accountant or um, or engineer or architect, you want to list the professional licenses here. Go forward, Pam. And you want to list your largest con uh, contracts here. Um, if you only have one, that's fine. You can list the one. If you don't have any um, and you just started your business, you can say, you know, not applicable, um, you know, trying to get a, a contract. Um, and, and if you do, you want to list the project name, the prime contractor, the location of the project, type of work, et cetera. This section here, um, beneath that section, it says airport concession. That's the ACDBE. You, you heard us mention at the beginning of this, the ACDBE. ACDBE means Airport Concession Disadvantaged Business Enter Enterprise. And Airport Concession is only that, that um, business that um, serves the flying public. So in most instances, this would be a commodity supplier or if you have a restaurant or store or, or that sort of thing. But it also includes people who service those firms that service the flying public. So if you're a CPA and you're offering accounting services to uh, Newport News, <coughs> excuse me, at the airport, then you can be an ACDBE. If you already um, possess, if you're, if you're uh, certified in another state and you already have a, a store at say Chicago O'Hare, then you wanna list that here in this section. But do know that when we receive an application, we're reviewing it for both. So we're considering you for ACDBE. If it applies to the services you provide, you will automatically get the ACDBE as well. So if you're a consultant providing, say, staffing services for, um, for um, a restaurant at the, at the airport, then you're servicing another firm that services the flying public, and therefore you would qualify for ACDBE. Go for it. This is your acknowledgement that you understand the laws and the rules and the legislation, excuse me, that apply to <clears throat> the DBE program. This is a federal program and it's very important that you understand um, all the rules and regulations of the uh, 49 CFR part 23 and 26. Don't forget, I know it's kind of hard to, um, kind of easy to miss. Um, and I'm often sending this form back to people don't forget at the bottom, you must, ha you must have a notary um, uh, witness this statement and witness your signature. So make sure you get this, this form right here notarized. Move forward, Pam. And the next is the financial statement. This is the personal net worth statement for the DBE, ACDBE program for eligibility. This should be filled out by the 51% owner who's claiming disadvantaged status. And let me mention, there are some firms that may be 33 and a third owner. So maybe you have three owners. You're gonna need at least two of them to fill out this form. And those two should be of the um, category that we listed in the, in the beginning, either a woman um, um, business owner or one of the ethnic minority business owners. So if it's if it's if nobody's 51, then you need at least 51 percent um, to qualify uh, in for the DBE program. So we will need two, at least two for uh, for a firm in that situation. So you want to complete the top part, the assets, um, and the liability section here correspond to the next to what's on the next two pages. 
So you might want to fill out the next two pages first and then come back and fill out the totals that you came up with um, on those pages here. Um, so you have to list your cash and cash equivalents. Retirement accounts, I know I've had several this week actually ask me if retirement accounts are counted in your assets. And yes, they are. They're considered liquid still, so they are counted as uh, part of your personal net worth. You want to list the totals here um, for that, for uh, any brokerage accounts or investment accounts you might have, any assets held in trust. <clears throat> um, all that should be listed in this section. In the liability section, again, um, you want to list all your liabilities. You're not listed, listing the mortgage on your primary residence, nor in the assets section are you, are you listing the value of your home. Go to page two for me, Pam. On page two in the property section, which is in the middle of the page, you'll see that we're asking you about your primary residence. We do want to know these, the answers to the, you know, to each of these sections. However, the totals of your primary residence is not going on your totals page, the no, page number one. Go back to page number one for me, Pam. I know we're going back and forth. So your primary residence would not be listed um, as, a, as an asset, right? But you do want, if you have rental properties or other, um, maybe you have you know, an acre of land in North Carolina, you wanna list that, the value of that on this front page, but you are not listing the value of your primary residence that you are telling us about on the second page. I hope I'm making sense please ask a question in the Q and A uh, on the Q and A section if that doesn't make sense. Um, notes payable to banks and others. Here's where you wanna list your credit cards. Um, maybe you have student loans. Um, you wanna list them here. Um, but this, these sections up here again are totals. So what you're doing is you're filling out the other pages and then you're bringing the totals forward to this page. Go to the second page, Pam. So again, that's the real estate section here in the middle of the page. You, you're going to list your primary residence, the, the um, address, the date acquired, the purchase price, the present market value. It's OK to use the, um, the um, just value from the property appraiser's website. You can use that as the, um, as the, mar as the valuation. Um, <clears throat> property B and property C. Um, those are properties that are in addition to your primary residence. You want to list those here. These figures do go on page one under the res under the um, the real estate section, um, but not the primary residence. Life insurance held. You want to list your life insurance, and like you can, you can see here where it says face value, and then <clears throat> excuse me, cash surrender amount. Excuse me a second. Okay, life insurance. <clears throat> You're going to list the face value of the of the life insurance, but the cash surrender amount is the only figure we are concerned about on the first page. So only if that um, if that um, um, life insurance is is has liquid value. So if you can cash it out, say you have five hundred thousand, but you can you can borrow fifty. 50,000 up to 50,000 against that 500,000, then you only want to list that 50,000 on that first page um, as the cash surrender amount. Um, again, ask questions if you have questions about that one. One more page, Pam. This is the final page. This is um, the type of property uh, or assets you want to, you can list your, your um, automobiles, your personal automobiles, not the company, not those that are in the company name, but your personal um, vehicles. You want to list those here, total present value. You can, you can look that up on Kelly Blue Book to get the present value. And of course, the, um, the loan against it, if you have one, you want to list that as well. So the, the automobile, the total present value would be listed as an asset back on page one. 
and the amount of liability will be listed, of course, in the liability section on page one. Household goods, that's self-explanatory. Other assets would be maybe you own a boat. Uh, you like to fish, so you have a small boat or you have a jet ski or, you know, we're in Florida, so <laughs> watercraft is, people often own some sort of watercraft. You can list that here under the un other um, assets. Section seven, people often leave this blank. They'll send me their affiliate tax returns, but then they don't tell me on this page that they have ownership in another company. So if you have more than 5% ownership in another company, you want to list that company here and the value of that company. Um, section H, you can list any other liabilities, your personal liabilities, not the companies, and any unpaid taxes, your personal taxes, not the firm. Again, this is another form that has the notary certificate really, really tiny at the bottom of the form. So don't forget to get this, this page notarized as well. Um, so there's two notaries you have to get on the, the page, the last page of the application that says, I understand the rules and regulations of the DBE program. That should be notarized and the financial statement should be notarized. Next, I think that might be the last, isn't it? Okay, this, this section um, describes what I just described to you, but I always find people um, look at this and say, I couldn't make heads or tails of this. So, you know, if you have any questions about filling out the financial statement, just give us a call. We'll, we'll answer your questions for you. Next. So now we're at the, the Q&A section. And I know there's a lot of questions. I see there's 14 in the chat and 11 in the Q&A. So let's have at it. Great job, Ms. Roberts. So yes, we have quite a few questions that um, are in the Q&A. I will read them aloud so that you can answer them so that everyone can hear the answer. Okay. Um, and just a reminder to those of you, if you have placed your question in the chat to ensure that we don't miss it, please make sure you copy and paste it over into the Q&A. I will go back and review the chat just to double check, but it'll make it easier if they're all in the Q&A. Okay, so the first question that we have, Ms. Roberts, is from Denise. And um, I did put in the chat, I'll say this again to everybody, this is with regards to the presentation. It is being recorded. It will be made available in approximately two to three business days. So I would say by early to mid next week, you should be able to access the recording on our YouTube page. Um, if you would like the presentation specifically, then we can make arrangements to get that to you as well. But this will be made available to everyone to have access to at your convenience on our YouTube channel. Um, so Melina would like to know, Ms. Roberts, where to find all of these forms that you have referenced. Okay, if you go to our website, www.broward.org forward slash econ dev, that's E-C-O-N as in nothing, dev, D as in dog, E, V as in Victor. Go, when you get to that page, there's a little picture of a certificate and it says get certified. You want to click on that. And then from there, you'll click on federal certification program, and that'll take you to the application and the financial statement, and also a um, brief description of the requirements for the DBE, ACDBE. Excellent. And I just placed that information in the chat for everyone. So the website that Cheryl just referenced, as well as the next steps, are also in the chat for you to review. The next question is, um, hi, Cheryl, this is from Chelsea. Thank hi, you very Chelsea. much for assisting us with the application and for providing this webinar. Is there a personal net worth cap on the minority owners? Yes, that's 1.32 million. Again, as I mentioned, you do not have to um, include your primary residence, nor do you need to include the value of the business that you're um, seeking certification. But any other business you have, you need to list it. Any other personal property, real estate you have, you need to list it. And the cap is 1.32 million. I've had a number of questions about this, this number here about, well, I'm not worth 1.32 million. Does that mean I'm not eligible? No, no, no. It means that 1.32 is the cap, not the floor. It's the ceiling, not the floor, okay? 
that's a great distinction. Thanks for pointing that out, Cheryl, because yeah. that is a frequently asked question. I yeah. put that cap in the chat for you as well, ladies and gentlemen. The next question, Cheryl, is from Alejandro, and he is asking, is there a separate application for the ACDBE? No, as I pointed out on the application, there's an ACDBE section. You fill that out if you currently have, uh, say, a restaurant or a store at one of the airports. Um, but that, when you submit this application, we're considering you for both. Whether um, the ACDBE applies to you, you will get it automatically. If it doesn't apply to, your, to the services you provide, um, then you won't get it. Okay, the next question is from Roger. Roger would like to know, as a brokerage, I utilize transportation companies to complete jobs as subcontractors. So do the same rules apply for my company that would apply for traditional transportation companies? No, if you, if you are a trucking company, then we expect that you'll have a truck, um, whether you're delivering supplies or, or equipment or you know, you're, you're a trucking company that say delivers foodstuffs or whatever. But if you're a, a um, supplier of commodities and you use a trucking company to, to um, deliver those commodities to your clients, that's not considered a trucking company. You would want to list that in the, in the, um, in the description um, of your business services, but that we wouldn't consider you a trucking company. We would consider you a commodity supplier. And now there's a distinction too. If you do not, if you sell commodities and you do not have a warehouse and you do not keep inventory, you'll be listed in the um, DBE directory as a broker, but not as a retailer. Um, there's a distinction there. Very good. So here's a good question, uh, Ms. Cheryl. Um, so Build is asking, what is the difference between a SBE and a DBE? And how can a DBE substitute for SBE? Okay, so um, the, the quick answer is there, if, if a project involves federal funding, then that project is subject to DBE participation. Um, but the, the, the federal, federal projects also have small business um, um, goals on them as well. But we don't list those, we don't mix apples and oranges. When we, when we report payments to the FTA or the FAA, we list payments to DBEs as well as payments to small businesses. So they're kept separate. Um, if, if that's what you're talking about in the federal program. Now we have a SBE, which is a small business enterprise. That's our local program, that's with our local program. And those certifications apply to projects that are totally funded by Broward County. I hope I made, made that clear. Does he have a follow-up to that? Um, Bill, if you have a follow-up question or actually, let me take a look. If you, Let's see. If you raise your hand, Bill, then I can allow you to talk to clarify your question. So if you if that didn't answer your question, Bill, please at the bottom click the raise your hand button. And when I see it, then I will give you access to talk. I'll unmute you so that you can clarify your question. While we oh there, there, there we go. Go ahead, Bill. You're able to talk. Click on mute, and then you should be able to talk. Oh, looks like we lost them. Okay, if they circle back, um, Cheryl, then we'll come back to them. I'll okay. look to see if the hand comes up. There it is. He needs to unmute. Go ahead, build unmute. Okay. There you go. There we go. Uh, there thank you. Go. you. Hey, uh huh. Good afternoon. First of all, I have to thank you. You've been in this business for a long time. I appreciate you're still there and making impact in the lives of minority. Thank you. I got everything you said. I'm comfortable with the answer. Second answer I was asking, 
can I register DBE and CDB in Broward, even though my headquarters is not in Broward? No, you cannot. Um, the CBE and SBE certifications are for Broward County firms only. Mm -hmm. the DBE, you certainly can be DBE and do projects in Broward, but you're going to have to apply for DBE certification wherever you are located. Are you in Miami? No, I'm in Palm Beach. Palm Beach. Palm Beach, you need to contact the Florida Department of Transportation in Tallahassee. Okay. Um, and they will tell you what UCP to, to go to. We don't, we used to, but we no longer do um, re, uh, look at applications for Palm Beach County firms. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Cheryl, the next question is um, with regard to the CBE program. Mm -hmm. So does the CBE program for Broward County exclude the personal residence and the ownership interest in the business firm from the personal net worth cap also? Yes, it does. Quick answer. Yeah. Okay. And Oswaldo has been in here assisting, answering some of these questions. Thank you, Mr. Costco. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question from Dominique is, if I own a property, but I am renting, what do I list as my primary residence? I'm not sure I understand. You, you, you own a you own a property, but you're renting in another property. Your primary residence would be blank because you don't own a, pri a primary residence. You, you only own an investment property. And so that would be listed on the property um, letter B. You would list that and you know the mortgage and, and all that in that section. But the where it says primary residence, leave that blank because you're renting. So you don't own you know, a primary residence. Great, thank you. And uh, Danique, if that does not clarify or answer the question, then please feel free to raise your hand and I will allow you to clarify your question. Um, next question is from Calvin. How can we apply for the federal DBE certification and not just the state of Florida one? Seems like there's a little bit of confusion there. Okay, so the, the US Department of Transportation in order for them to operate to, to function properly, they need to have locations all over the country. So each state has its own, what we call UCP, which is a unified certification program. For the larger states, they will have several UCPs. So Florida has several UCPs that process applications and, and um, grant the DBE certification. If you're DBE certificated in the state of Florida, you can do business all over the country, but wherever you're trying to do business, say you're trying to do business in Georgia at, at, at the Atlanta airport, you need to get certified in Georgia. Now they have something called the interstate program, which means that there's a expedited process to get certified in another state. So firms that say come from Texas to Florida because they wanna do business at the Tampa airport, would contact the Tampa office and would have to submit the original application that they submitted to their home state, the financial statement and the tax returns and whatever other documents that that particular UCP requires. Most UCPs won't require you to do a whole application again. They'll just wanna see the, the original application that you submitted in order to get DBE certified in your home state and then what they'll do is like for us, in the instance with the Texas company, what I will do is I will contact the Texas UCP and get a copy of the site visit from them for your firm. So, so the short answer is DBE certification is DBE certification all over the country, but you do have to, each state has their own requirements. So you do have to follow their requirements to get certified in their state but it won't be the whole process that you're going through that I'm describing today. I hope I'm clear. Excellent. Um, the next question is referring to page six of the application. Pam, if you're able to get back to page six so we can have a point of reference. On page six of the application, B, relationships and dealings with other business for the 51% owner or all owners? This actually, 
this actually is is for both the majority owner and the business itself. And the reason I say that, yes, we're we're very interested in the majority owner, but the firm, if it if the firm has a relationship with another business, so again, the example I used is you're sharing a space with someone, or you're sharing warehouse um, space with another with another firm, or say a firm if you're if you're a um, commodity supplier, and you have a relationship with um, you know, one of the larger furniture suppliers and they allow you a little space in their warehouse. You want to describe that here. If that does not apply, just check no. If you have no other relationships, no financial relationships, um, inventory relationship, um, um, facility relationship or staff relationship, then you don't need to fill out this section. Okay. And if you can go to section F, Pam. F is in Frank. On what page? Oh, here? They didn't state a page, it said section F. So it says, does section F include loans that are paid off already? Yes. And you wanna say if it, where it says current balance, you would put zero. But yes, we do want to know the loans that, that you have. Now, if you're, you know, if your business has been in business for 50 years, then, you know, I, I don't necessarily need to see a loan that was paid off in 1971. But, you know, um, yeah, if, if, you, if you have a loan and say you got a, a, this is a good example. Say you got a PPP loan and, you know, you, you used your PPP loan to, you know, to keep your employees and you don't owe anything on it because you know the, the SBA said, well, these loans, if you use it to maintain your staff, then you don't have to pay them back. They become a grant. You want to put that in here. And we do want to see the paperwork for the PPP loan. Um, so that's hopefully clarified that. Thank you, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. And we've got several more questions, but before we continue with the questions, I want to take this opportunity to have my staff put up our poll because it's important that we get information from you regarding our services and if this webinar has been uh, beneficial for you. So as we work and strive to do outreach and activities that um, provide you with practical and useful information, we need your feedback to share with us um, your insight with whether or not this has been helpful for you. That allows us to continue to make um, these type of uh, workshops available and or to make necessary changes and adjustments so that we can ensure that we are meeting your needs as uh, business owners or in potential business owners. Um, so while that poll is going up, when you see it, it'll be available for a few minutes. It's just five quick questions. Please just quickly go through them and just take a quick second um, and answer those for us. I would greatly appreciate it. It should be available on your screen at this time. And while you're answering um, those poll questions, we will continue with the survey. Um, Roger um, Dowdell, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Um, his, uh, he had asked a question, Cheryl, and he um, lost audio, so he didn't get a chance mm -hmm. to hear it. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to talk, Mr. Rogers, so that you can ask your question. I've just asked you to unmute. If you can unmute yourself, then you can ask your question. I've unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, so for myself, um, I was wondering if, transportation company rules apply um, with my company being a freight brokerage because we work with transportation companies and some of the ones that we may dispatch to deliver, um, they could vary. So do we list the type of commodities we work with or do we list, how, how does that work? Well, you list the commodities. We wouldn't, if you don't have a truck, you're not a trucking company. Um, that's right. that's sort of the, the the bottom line for the DBE certification. If you consider yourself a transportation or a trucking company, you must have at least one truck. Um, right. We would expect you to have a you know several, but if you you know you need to have at least one. But if you're a commodity supplier, then yes, you need to list the commodities that you supply. And if you use freight to to um, transport those commodities or say to deliver them to your client, then, then you just, you know, you describe that on that front page where it says 
you know, describe the services you provide. Okay, I understood. Um, the other thing that I mentioned that I don't think you heard is that there's a difference between a broker and a supplier. Um, right. So if you don't keep your own inventory, um, but you're a, say, an authorized dealership for lawnmowers, then you would be listed. You can get certified, but you would be listed in the directory as a broker. So just, you know, but be aware of that. Would that, would that in turn affect the certification that I would be available? Because like some of my, some of the companies I work with um, are medium sized. Mm -hmm. They're not small. So yeah, if we I want, do, we're not asking for the, the tax returns of those companies that you work with to deliver. Right. Um, um, and we are not asking for the tax returns of the company that you get your supplies from, um, that you that you then go ahead to, and, and sell. It's just that as a broker um, versus a, a, a supplier of goods and services that, you know, they have their own inventory, there's a difference when, when a firm is looking to fill their goal, you know, their, their um, goal requirements on a particular project, they may weigh a little heavier on the, on the firm that actually has supplies in their warehouse versus the broker, only because maybe they can get, you know, semen or aggregate or whatever, and they need it on the same day. Whereas a broker probably couldn't supply it on the same day. It may take them 24 hours or 48 hours or something like that. Um, so if, if, a, if a prime contractor is looking for someone who sells aggregate, they're going to expect that that aggregate is something that that, that firm maintains. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm going to continue with the questions. So just a reminder, we got just a little over half of you that have uh, participated in the poll. Please take just a few minutes. The poll will be open just for a couple of more moments for you to participate. Um, so Cheryl, uh, Cheryl, one of the questions we have, and it looks like Oswaldo already answered it, but I think it's okay. a good one to ask aloud as well, is um, does this mean if I want to do business in Miami-Dade, um, I could consider getting certified in that county? And Oswaldo reiterated that if they are certified as a DBE in Miami, you don't need to be certified in Broward County. The DBE certification is good statewide. That is correct. Okay. Um, so then the next question um, is, is it possible, and, and again, we've kind of touched on this, but we'll reiterate, is it possible to use the same CBE application to apply for an ACDBE program? No, it's not. They're two separate programs um, with two separate applications. So if you're interested in the DBE, you need to apply for the DBE using the DBE application. And if you're interested in the CBE, you have to fill out a separate application. Um, the personal net worth um, worksheet for the local program is a lot different than the, um, than the federal program. You're actually listing totals. You're not, you know, you're not giving us the detail that you give us for the DBE. But they are totally separate programs um, with, with different legislations and ordinances that apply to them. Thank you for clarifying that, Cheryl. And Sydney would like to know, do we accept the submission of this application via email? Um, I want to say yes, um, but some, some DBE applications are extremely large. So we're, we're allowed um, to, to copy up to 50 pages without charging people. And we don't charge for our applications. So if your, if your application is pretty thick, I would really uh, appreciate it. And everyone in our office would appreciate if you just mail it. Um, you can submit um, a smaller application via online. And if you're going to do that, submit it to SB CERT. That's an S as in Sam, B as in boy, CERT for certification, C-E-R-T at Broward.org. That's SB CERT at Broward.org. You don't want to submit it to a staff person because that person may not be there at that time or they may be on vacation. And that SB CERT mailbox is our certification clearinghouse. 
Thank you, Cheryl. And that email address has been added to the chat for those of you who would like to copy and paste it or, or write it down. It's sbcert at broward.org, as Cheryl mentioned, and it's available to review to view in the chat. Alejandro, I see your hand, so I'm going to come to you to unmute you to allow you to talk to ask your question. Please go ahead and click unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Sure can. Yes, we can. Hi, uh, thank you so much for uh, this presentation. Um, I have actually I have two questions, if I may. One is um, I'm already uh, certified as a DBE. Uh, so would that uh, uh, so that means that I'm also certified as a as an ACDBE? Um, not necessarily. If if you didn't if if the um, UCP agency that certified you did not give you ACDBE, then you need to contact them and tell them you're interested in it. Um, I did not mention that if you're in construction, you are not um, you're not ACDBE eligible. Again, ACDBE is for concessionaires or people that service concessionaires, and that does not include, include build outs. So if you're in the construction field, you're not ACDBE qualified, I mean, eligible. That includes for engineering firms. Um, yeah, engineering firms is usually about build outs. So yes, that would include engineering firms. Okay, okay, thanks for clarifying that. And then my other question is, the 1.3 million cap uh, network, is that only for the owner or as a family? That's, that's the owner. Um, and the person that's, 50, that's claiming 51% um, status. And Florida is a community property state. So everything that your wife owns is half yours, um, if that's the case, if, if, even if she's not um, a part of the business. Um, so say you have um, property that, that you both own jointly. That property, you should list 50% of that property um, on the totals on that, that, that first page. So say you have, um, I don't know, a, a, you have four acres of land in Georgia and it's worth $50,000. You only wanna put $25,000 on that first page under mm -hmm. real estate. Got it, got it, okay. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your questions, Alejandro. They were. Um, next, um, Chelsea Loop. I see that you're still with us and you have a question that looks like it was a follow-up. Um, I'm gonna unmute you to clarify because it's it's in kind of delayed now. So it's you're saying hi, even on the minority 49% owners, but I'm not sure what that's in reference to. So I have just asked you to unmute if you can unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Sure can. Yes, I can. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Cheryl. We really appreciate um, the time to be able to speak with both of you and Tatiana um, on this call today. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, I know that there is a personal net worth cap um, of uh, 1.32 million on the 51% um, or majority owners that would be qualifying for a DBE or maybe a CBE with Broward County. But is that personal net worth cap requirement also on any minority owners? So let's say that I'm in a in a group of three or more people or five or more people, whichever, does that 1.32 million cap and do you also need the personal financial holdings of those people who are not the majority owner? Yeah, so you have to, you have to um, submit up to 51%. So as I mentioned, if it's 33 and a third, then we would need two of those on, at least two of those owners personal net worth statement. Okay. Um, if it's 50-50, we would need both. But oh, if it's okay. 51, 49, I don't need to see the 49. You don't need to see the 49 if it's 51, 49. Okay. And right. But the, the 51 person has to be the person in control of the firm. Right. And that's of very course. important. Yeah. And, and you have to, I mean, during the application review process, as well as the site visit, we're looking for, we're looking to make sure that the person that's claiming disadvantaged status is in control of that firm. And right. which means that person left that firm would no longer operate right that makes sense and i'm taking those notes and i appreciate that clarification and um would that also hold i know that i've seen i guess through the federal um websites and regulations that that is for the for the federal um dbe program does that also hold for the cbe for the broward county cbe program as well for the for the uh personal net worth for the 49 
No, the, the, the Broward County um, ordinance um, around the local program, we need the personal net worth of all owners. Oh, okay. Um, the thing okay. is for, for the Broward County, because it's race and gender neutral, we're, we're not concerned with necessarily who's in control of the firm. Right. We're concerned that the firm is eligible and that the owners, all owners, if it's six owners, we need all six personal net worth, all of them have to individually have less than 1.32 million personal net worth. Each of them, all Each less than 1.3. Okay, okay, not an exactly. aggregate. Okay. And again, in the state of Florida, it's a community property state. So, so if you have, you know, if you have 500,000 worth of property, then you just put 250,000 as, as the total because your husband or, you know, your partner or whatever has the other half. Okay, okay. Thank you so much for that clarification. Sure. That was very helpful. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Okay. Um, so Cheryl, there's a question from Cherie um, stating that just trying to clarify. So I'm responding um, and writing just so that she, you know, she get the answer. But with regards to DBE, um, since it is the federal program, even though she's in Miami, mm -hmm. she can still apply for it. But just clarify that the, the location she has to apply for. So she has to go to she's my. Eligible. She's eligible, and she can do business at the Fort Lauderdale Airport. But she has to get certified in Miami. Um, you can go to Miami.gov and search for certification, and you should see information on there on how to apply for DBE through them. Very good. Hope that, hopefully that provides some clarity for you, uh, Cherie. Um, so let's see, um, Winifred would like to know, um, I have a medical staffing agency. Is there any work for my agency with the federal government? Is it worth filling out the DBE application? Medical staffing? Um, that's a good question, let me think. I, I don't think so. I was trying to think if maybe in transportation or highways. Not for medical staffing. We have several staffing um, organizations that are certified with us. They usually will supply either security like TSA or they supply restaurant workers or construction workers. But I, I've never seen a medical staff worker get any kind of work at the airport. Okay, good question. Um, so can you share how airports um, learn or find out about certified companies with regards to the database or how they learn about these certified? Well, once you're certified, yeah, once we review your application and, and, and make sure that you're eligible for the program and we approve your certification application, we um, enter your information in the Florida Department of Transportation Certified Firm database. What primes will do when they're, when they're needing to fill their, um, you know, their goals on projects that are federally funded, they check the Florida Department of Transportation's database of certified firms. And they usually will search based on NAICS codes. That's why I said to give a really explicit um, accounting of all the services you provide in that in that section on the first page of the application because if if we see that you've missed because it also asks for you to list the the next codes that apply to your firm but if we see after reading your your detailed list of the services you you supply that um that you've missed a, a next code we'll add it for you um, so you want to we you want to make sure that everything that you provide is listed under the NAICS codes because prime contractors search that directory for NAICS codes. Excellent, and that is like to reiterate we have questions regarding the cost of certification. So the application is free. There is no application fee to um, apply. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, we are a promotional products company, uh, Brian Oliver is asking, and we are finding a challenge for a classifying category. What would you suggest? 
Um, that's going to be, I, I would, I would want to take a look at it um, because I'm pretty familiar with NAICS code. So I can, you know, I can do the search for you. What I would do is um, I would, I would list as many NAICS codes as you can find um, on the application. And again, tell me that, you know, I sell booties and I couldn't find the, <laughs> the NAICS, the NAICS code for booties. You know, I'll look at it for you. Most people get that NAICS code that's for um, um, durable goods. The the one that says um, something about durable goods. I forget, I think it's 423350 or something. Um, but that's the one that covers booties and <laughs> and promotional items. But yeah, if you if you're pretty um, um, explicit about the, the items that you sell in that section where it says describe what you do, then we'll, you know, we'll locate those next codes for you. And if you ever find that, you know, your, your listing doesn't include a next code that you'd like to include, you can send me an email after you've been certified, of course, send me an email and say, Cheryl, I'd like to add whatever next code. And if there's something I need further from you, so say you're adding, you know, I now, you know, sell electrical supplies then I'm going to want to see your inventory of electrical supplies because, you know, when you first got certified, you said you sold janitorial supplies. So if you want to add electrical supplies, I may ask you for your inventory or pictures of your inventory. I may even do a site visit and take pictures myself. Okay. Um, Cheryl, can a company with no employees that, sub that subcontracts the jobs be certified? Um, that's a good question. I, I, you have to have a commercially useful function. So, you know, if, if all of the work that you do is outsourced to other people, then that really isn't a commercially useful function. But say you're a GC and you need um, to subcontract to an electrician or a roofer, that's fine. That's, that's not a problem. But if all you do is, you know, point people and, and you know, um, um, hire others, subcontractors to do the work for your company. It's not considered a commercially useful function. What you want to do to get a better explanation of what a commercially useful function is, is search for that on the USDOT website. They have a pretty um, expansive website. If you, do a, if you do commercially useful function, you'll get all the pages that describe what commercially useful function is. But you must have a commercially useful function in order to be DBE certified. And that includes the, the local program as well, the CBE and SBE. Okay. Um, what is the average time frame for a response to the application? That's long. It's, it's right now we're running about 60 to 90 days. Um, the DBE application is a complicated one, and we we actually um, we review it within probably two or three weeks of receipt. And if we're missing anything, the clock hasn't started yet. So if we're missing anything, and we and if it's significant, we're just going to send the application back to you. And that person had asked about whether or not they could email the application. If we receive that email and that email does not include all the supporting documents, we're going to email you back and say, I'm returning this application to you until you provide all the documents. Um, but the clock starts once we receive all the documents. So it's best and it's, it's most expedited if you supply us with a complete application. Again, those items on that internal checklist that I shared with you guys, make sure that you respond to all those items and let us know that, you know, if I, if you're not a construction company, then I know you don't have construction equipment, but not applicable is, is not acceptable. So you need to say, I'm not a construction company and therefore I have no construction equipment. That makes sense. Okay. And we are coming down the home stretch with questions. Um, so um, it looks like we've got three left. So Renee Christie is asking, would environmental companies, asbestos, mold, indoor air quality, et cetera, testing and inspecting meet requirements for certification? Yeah, certainly, certainly. For, for the DBE, now it depends on um, the services you provide um, for the ACDBE, but in that instance, I would, I would 
um, like to defer until we review your application before I say your ACDBE is certifiable or not. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly that is, I mean, there, there would be projects in, you know, both transit as well as airports and seaports um, that may require those, those services. Okay. And we are a construction company. Like I think you just talked about this kind of, you just hit on this regarding a general contractor. Will we be able to get ACDBE certified? No, you will not. Okay. Quick answer. <laughs> and last question um, with regards to, I guess with this is the, the we were talking about the husband and wife and ownership. Can you put totals for husband and wife owners on one net worth application? No, do not do that. If you're a 50 50 firm, then we want to see a, a personal net worth um, financial statement from you and from your husband. So separate right. them. Excellent job. That completes all of the questions that we've had. Um, we want to make sure that we thank you on behalf of our director, Mr. McDonald, uh, for your time today. Um, again, this information has been recorded. It will be made available on our YouTube channel in about two to three business days. So again, by beginning to mid next week, you can look for it. We have put information in the chat. The chat is still available for you to see. So please feel free to slide through and copy and paste those relevant um, emails or um, person that worth, you know, numbers and things that you would, might need for reference um, with regarding contacting us and or accessing the application. Um, Cheryl, did you have anything that you wanted to conclude with? Oh, I just want to thank everybody for participating. Um, do know that there are airports all over the country that are actually, um, there's a lot of projects out there. So the, the sooner you get DBE certified, the sooner you can participate in these projects. Very good. Well, thank you all again for your time and for taking the time out to join us here today for this uh, technical assistance training program on completing your federal application. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Perfect. Thank you, guys.